Good morning, good morning, St. Martin. What's up? What's cooking? Today is my 100th episode of this program, and I decided also, starting today, to change it up a lot. You know, I have had long podcasts, and many people told me while the topics were great, the time was too much, and it became difficult for them to follow. Even though I must say, I have a lot of followers that are faithful and every week I get my feedback. So while I know I'm going to change it up, I am happy that I decided to do it on my 100th episode. So let me start off here. You know, over the years, as I did this podcast, I realized that the need for information was there. Not the need for Melly, the need for information. So I decided to do my research before I speak on this program. And the reason I did that is because I, while I am a politician, I am still a senator, I try in my program as much as possible not to give it a political tint. Because I believe that once people are well informed, they will make a decision that they can live with another decision that was politically motivated for whatever reason. Let me congratulate everybody in St. Martin for a great, great St. Martin Day cultural parade. I truly enjoyed it. I even tried broadcasting it a little bit, getting it out to the people because there were many people that were at home that could not make it or they were working and couldn't sit down and watch the whole parade for let's say an hour, an hour and a half. So by the little snips and bits that I was able to give on the Bush Road, I think many people enjoyed it. I got a lot of great, great feedback. But to the organizers and all the participants and the public of St. Martin, congratulations. I think we had one of the most spectacular St. Martin Day cultural parades. The schools especially did a great job and made this something to be proud of. Now, I, I read in the newspaper that Minister Lambrix pledged commitment to open the LNG transshipment port on St. Martin. I think the good minister has no clue what he's talking about. The good minister doesn't understand what it means. He doesn't understand the location that is going to be needed for these things because you can't put it in the port where we right now have all the cruise ships. The cruise ships are a different story on their own already. And if you want to have a transshipment point, you will have to create something different because storing it at certain temperatures is totally different than having a badge pull alongside a cruise ship and fuel them with LNG gas. These are two totally different things. The good minister seems not to understand this too good. This is not the first time Crowley has been in Samaritan. I chaired a meeting where Crowley was present and I, this is a respectable company, so I am not going to delve into the company. It's just simply the minister has no clue. He thinks a trip to Puerto Rico is going to fix all of this and everything is like the Dutchman would say, cook and egg, but it is not. There takes a lot more to it. The location they were looking for in the past were down K Bay, filling in part of the bay to create a container pack down there and also create storage down there for fuel products, etc. So minister, you know, do your homework. Don't make false promises. Don't go down there and um, exchange promises for things. Those are things that get you in serious problem when the carbon copy comes up. But for now, let me just leave this in the category of utter nonsense because that's what it is. Now, parliament held a meeting last week and at this point in time, we are still no further than we were before the meeting started. And I'm talking about a meeting of the Sustainable, Accessible, Affordable Health Act. The, the, I call it the AHA story because it ain't going no place, right? Not in the way it is. Not with what it is going to represent and how it's going to represent it. I believe we need one. I strongly believe that. But I believe that we have to be honest about what this is going to cost and how we are going to pay for it. And that is not clear at all. We talk a nice talk about it, or oh, the employer this and or oh, the employee that. But when you have minimum wage, you're making it a bigger burden 
than a help. When people have to know, everybody has to go and pay. So those that don't work, those that don't have um, any sort of income, government gonna pay for it. Uh, that sounds nice, but government can't even afford to pay their own police officers and others, COLA and all that, but we gonna pay for it. I mean, you know, I don't wanna put it in the category of utter nonsense because it's not utter nonsense. We need healthcare. But it is a very awkward way of trying to sell a product because elections come in. That's the danger. This government now rushing out things as if all of these things were in the pipeline for four years and now they're coming out like bullets. Utter lies, that is. The problem is they have lost face and credibility. So now they're starting to lie and do things that are only going to hurt this country more than it's going to help this country. I need the Minister of Justice to come out publicly and explain to the country St. Martin, explain to the region why in God's name we are repatriating Haitians to Haiti right now. When we know of the civil war, we know how the gangs are controlling the streets. The police can't help. Canada, America want to send them military to help. But we are repatriating people. We have to be careful. I am not saying that we can't repatriate people. But the last time Haiti had an earthquake, we did not repatriate. Hurricanes came and countries were hit. We did not repatriate people to those countries back. Venezuela had a crisis. We did not send back the people. Why are we doing it now? What is the reason? You gotta explain the people of Samaritan this. The petition that was put in is gonna have a long life because this is now going to create unnecessary international attention. We walk around and we take pictures and we pose, but we put people's lives at stake when we are sending them back home. Right now, it seems that one has already um, been killed and the possibility that two more might have also met an untimely fate are being investigated, but it is sad to put it mildly. We cannot, as a country, behave this way. Yes, I've always spoken about undocumented workers and people living on this island and the problem they bring to your economy, your social well-being. But this is an exception because people are dying in Haiti. You don't send people into a war zone. You wouldn't send back Palestinians now to Gaza either. So why are we doing this? Please, Minister, come out and explain. Because I know you sleep good at night, but many of these people and their families don't. Wondering what's happening to their people back home. This, Madam Minister, is a human rights issue. We are signatory to that human rights issue. Please. Think about what you're doing, because I don't understand it. Now, St. Martin's Day, has this become a commercial something? While I understand we need to cater to our guests, we, we need to cater to ourselves also. I'm trying to, to look at it because I know a lot of places were closed. I, I, a lot of places were closed. With exception of bars and restaurants normally that you know people go to eat people go to drink at least you know the, the town was closed off good casinos were closed but still you get the impression as if we are commercializing st martin day and i need us to go back to the drawing board and ask ourselves the question what is st martin what does St. Martin's Day mean? Is this a unity day? That Claude and Dr. Petit came together 64 years ago and said, let's celebrate this day as the unity between French St. Martin and Dutch St. Martin? If that's what it is, if that's what it is, and times have changed, we are 64 years further, we ain't gonna more donkey races, we ain't gonna more, um, 
jumping in the bag and running with the egg and the wheelbarrow race. Sure, we have changed that. We don't pull the nets anymore. I agree. But let's agree to how commercial we'll make it. Because at the end of the day, when we do things, let's do them for a good reason. And when I say that, I mean that. We went and painted the bridge white because the parade was passing there. But we didn't think it was wise enough to fix the bridge so the pedestrians can pass. Because up until today, Prince Bernard Bridge is not fixed. There's still a section, I made a little video about it because I want to show you that we need to put our priorities in the right place. And that goes to Samantha data. Today my topic is going to be poverty eradication. Can we eliminate it truly? Can we stop poverty in St. Martin? Can we turn the clock? Can we ensure that everyone can earn enough to be above the poverty line of about 3,500 guilders a month in country St. Martin? Now, this question has been asked and debated many times. Very few people, though, come with an answer. One such person is Dr. Raymond Yizrun from the Anti-Poverty Platform. I listened to a discussion, a panel discussion they had at the university, and I, I'm not going to say I was blown away, because the same discussion Mr. Yizrun had there he had two years before in Parliament, and I was one of the naysayers. I didn't believe how he was seeing it. And I said, we are interpreting this wrong. But the more you read, the more you delve into it, the more you realize that he wasn't wrong. So I decided to look at it from four different angles today. The laws and treaties we are governed by, that is the position of Mr. Yezru. The cost of goods and services in this country, that's an economic position. The acceptable standard of living, that is what do we accept? What do we say? This is the bare minimum we are willing to accept. And how do we deal with the undocumented issue and the money flight that it creates? When you look at those four things together, you might get a different opinion on what's possible and what's not possible. So let's go and look first at the laws and treaties we are governed by. It would be, if we would implement the laws as we know them in our kingdom and adhere to the treaties signed off by our kingdom that ensure equality for all in the kingdom, then we should easily be able to eradicate poverty. But when this discussion comes up, we immediately hear that we are autonomous and we need to fend for ourselves as per the charter. The same charter that says that human rights and equality must be guaranteed by the kingdom. I think that's Article 44 or 43. You see, it is these type of confusions that intentionally keep us where we are. Christ, like if you want to have prosperity and a good social system, pension, education, and healthcare, you must pay the premiums and taxes. And that sounds fair. But when you live in a country where more than half of your country earns minimum wage and three quarters of your country lives under 3,500 guilders, the livable wage for this country as calculated by the experts in this country. And you belong to a kingdom where the sovereign country is one of the 10 most richest nations economically. Then you need to ask yourself, a simple question. Are we equal? Are we being treated equal? Were we given a fair opportunity to reach 
to the equality we so desire to have in this kingdom. All of these things are things that play a role. All of these things change the way we look at each other in the kingdom. We don't only have racism as a serious issue in the kingdom. We have equality as a bigger issue in the kingdom. Because equality doesn't necessarily have to do with your skin color. It has to do with what you're allowed to do and how you're allowed to do it. It's nearly as if you're still a prisoner in your own country. Do we have fault in that? Oh sure we do. Oh sure we do. We have done things we shouldn't have done or we have done things that we could have done much better. But for whatever reason, we didn't do that. But it doesn't take away that what happened 20 years ago or 30 years ago, we're going to punish the generation of today with it. We never got the fair opportunity to exploit things for ourselves as a so-called autonomous country for the past 13 years because we are still controlled by a governor appointed by our colonizers. It, it, that, that simple it is. We can't turn around that. And there are all sorts of controlling agencies like the CFT, like the Integrity Chamber that came out recently in a whole discussion with, with the tripartite. Again, a complete illegal charter and by extension, a faulty and discriminatory constitution approved by this kingdom. Because Sir Martin didn't approve their constitution alone. The kingdom did. And Sir Martin can't change his constitution alone. They need permission from the kingdom. Do you see where I'm going? You can never be equal if somebody else going to decide for you if you're allowed to be equal. The huge difference between our social standings, our health care, our pension, our minimum wage, our education with others in our kingdom speaks volumes. The minimum, the social minimum in Curacao, Bonaire and Seba is becoming $1,750 come July 1st, 2024. That's seven months from now. We are still pushing nine guilders, 95 an hour. We would need to work about 350 hours a month, twice as much as we do now, to reach the social minimum in the best. But we equal. But we are equal. You see, we are right now in a well, and they are pouring water on us in that well to see how long we will survive. And it is really up to us how to do this. It's really up to us to decide what we're going to do. Because independence is not really an option right now. And we shouldn't use this battlefield to fuel that because it's the wrong fuel you're using. Now, let's go look at it from the angle of the cost of goods and services in this country. This, our country is so expensive and we don't do enough to regulate the prices of imported goods, especially by checking what they pay for them elsewhere. We accept the prices we get at the harbor, but we don't back check it. There was an Ecorus report done by a university economic uh, bureau in Amsterdam that led us down a different path a few years back. For whatever reason, that report has been sidelined now and we're moving on. And we accept whatever is told to us. Eggs, is, eggs, eggs were $10 a time. So they're back down to $3 and we accept it. We, nobody checks it. Oh yeah, there was an egg shortage. Oh, yeah, well, so what are they going on today? You see, we need to understand that if we can't control what's coming in, we can't control what's happening here unless we start producing it here. Aruba produces eggs for all its, all its inhabitants and the million tourists they get a year. 
They have chicken farms. We have them here too. But not at a big scale like in Aruba. We have a few chicken farms here. Agriculture. I, I, for the love of money, cannot understand why there is no serious money being pumped into agriculture. And the first is, oh, we don't have no land. You don't need land. You can use technology. We can use growing towers. I mean, come on. I have a piece of concrete. It's about 20 feet long, 10 feet wide, so 200 square feet, let's say 20 square meters. Have 10 grow towers on that. That produces every cycle 360 heads of whatever I plant. Well, my daughter does, not me. Let me not take credit for what's not mine. So please don't tell me it can't happen because it can happen. The problem is we don't want to give people a chance. We have an entrepreneurial program. Most of the people can't get a loan. They don't qualify it. This You make the rules so difficult that people can't qualify. Are you really helping the entrepreneurs or are you helping your mindset? Because that's the question we need to ask. We don't have a fishing fleet to say, hey, let's go to the Sabre Bank. We own a good piece of the Sabre Bank. Let's go there. Let's exploit the fishing. Let's use part of the lagoon or the coastline to do lobster farming, shrimp farming. We can do it. Invest in that, people. If we want to live a better life and eradicate poverty. But if we don't do this, then we should stop talking about it. Because then we are not serious about it. These are the problems that we face. It's going on four years now that I've been talking about legalizing the cannabis industry. It's a billion dollar industry. The islands around us have done it. We need all kinds of studies for something that has been going on for 50 years in Holland. We are the choppiest group of people put together and call the government. I'm telling you, we don't have the interests of the people at heart. We have our own pockets at heart. I think a politician said it. If they would just stop thiefing for one year and lying, we will be well off as a country once again. And I sincerely believe that. You see, this is the problem. We need to be aggressive. We can't wait for other people to give us a handout. We got to work for what we want. Remember, if we want to eradicate poverty, the people can't do it alone and the industry and its owning can do it alone. The government going to have to help. The government going to have to bring people up to par. We need to understand that we're going to have to have to have a subsidy program in place. We're going to have to help with housing. We're going to have to help with food, medical care, transportation, education. These things going to have to happen. And if we say, no, no, we ain't doing that. We don't have the money for that. Then our people will remain poor and we will not eradicate poverty because we need to bring them to a standard of living that we had in the 80s so they understand, so that they understand that you can live at a different level in life. Because we had it before, but we lost it over the years. We completely lost it. Now let's look at if we would look at our standard of living. What is acceptable? Now, very often, eh, when you look at what is acceptable, you have to look at what you earn because you can't live above your means. This is something we talk about every day and we hope people understand it. But the way they are living is not acceptable. And we know that as a government. We know that as a people in St. Martin. Yet we allow it because our own businessmen and women, they would hire undocumented people and let them pay a lower wage. You'll pay them a lower wage because 
They just want to earn money. So the standard of living stays at a lower level. We have one industry, tourism. That one pillar is not a pillar that pays a lot of money. It is not. If you had high-end tourism like Anguilla and Simbats had, yes, then it would have been a totally different operations because then when they go to a restaurant they drop a $50 tip because that's normal for them in their world they are a wealthy group of people today we have what we call the backpack tourists they get off the plane and for five dollars they want a chicken a johnny cake a soda and an ice cream if possible this is what we have if we like this or not this is what we have but again, too often, we don't even help those that we can help in our society. And when I said those that we can help, I'm speaking about the seniors. Why in God's name, we cannot agree to stop taxing the seniors? The difference is three million. We can find money for everything. We can't find money to help them. Yes, they got a break. 30, 40 years ago, when they had a mortgage and they were able to subtract things and their pension premiums, they were able to subtract. Yes, they got that break. But Jesus, you're going to punish them for that for the rest of their lives? Pull a line. Pull a line. It's three million, four million tops. Don't tell me we can't find that money and do something for the seniors, please. Because if that's the departure point, then indeed, we will keep everybody poor. Then that's really, really the level we want to go. You know, education is one of these other things that creates a standard of living for us that is very often unaffordable. Before you finish putting uniforms on your children in Samantha, I did it for my three grandchildren. It was $1,000 for them. And all I did was buy what they needed for the schools. Three cents. So, please. Somebody with minimum wage. How do they do this? How do you do this? House rent is at a very high level. How do you do this? Belvedere got 3,000 people on a waiting list. How do we do this? You see, we need to agree to how housing is going to look and not just come out here and scream, we're going to build a thousand houses and you don't build one. And oh, we're going to do this and oh, we're going to do that. You don't do nothing. Because that's what's happening all the time. That's the unfortunate path. But we have to address it if we really mean what we say. You know, we need to make Samaritan affordable for us. We need to care for us, and that's what I believe the party I am representing, the now party, is going to do. We have a subsidy program in place, and we will reveal it come November 22nd in our manifesto. So let's look at the last part now, and that is the undocumented issue and the money flight. How, how does that affect us? Well, very simple. We have a huge amount of undocumented people in Samaritan. And, you know, people say, oh, it's about a thousand. You know, it might be between ten and 15,000 people. Yeah, you heard me right. Between ten and 15,000 people that are living in this country and are undocumented. Some of them, about 3,000, are even registered by um, SFV because they're working. So a lot of people come here not because it is... Um, their vacation and their dream home. No, they come here because of financial reasons. They want to make money and send it back home to take care of their family. And this is something we also did when we used to go to Curacao to work in the refineries or when they went to Santo Domingo in the 30s to go and chop cane and send home money. So again, I am not saying, um, oh, don't leave on work, you know. I'm saying regulate it. Because when you regulate it, they pay their fair share when it comes to premiums, etc., etc., 
everybody then carries their burden and not a few carrying for many others. When we have undocumented people living in Samaritan, very often, very often, they live in extremely bad conditions. It's what we call imported poverty. We allow this to happen. We had it on Pawn Island, costed us $14 million through the trust fund to tell the people, we're going to buy up your land, we're going to pay off your house, we're going to pay off your business, etc., etc. $14 million it costed us. If we have to go across the island, we're going to need much more money. But the problem is this. Why are we not tackling the problem? We have border control. We, we have an agreement with the Dutch to help us um, protect our borders. But if they're inside, who does the job then? Is that immigration? Is that police? Who, who, who's going to do it? And if they, I'm not calling now to go stop every bus on the road, pull out everybody, check the papers like how they used to do in the past. But we must find a humane way to deal with this matter because it affects our economy if we like it or not. You must understand that the amount of money that leaves this country every week, go down by Western Union and those places and look at the lines, that money isn't coming back. That money is going to another country to take care of people in that country. They're not sending away our guilders, they're sending away US dollars. So we have a serious flight of currency that we need for our own import. These are the type of things that we need to understand and look at in one holistic view and say, okay, how do we really eradicate poverty in St. Martin? This is food for thought. I need you to think about it. Write about it later on the, on, on the podcast and give your opinions. All opinions are welcome. Everybody has a right to an opinion. Doesn't mean I'm going to share it, but I will respect your opinion. So what we got sharing this week here with the political nonsense again, because, you know, it has now taken a turn for the worst. Many politicians are right now, presently right now, shopping around for a new home yet. Their politicians on different parties are not sure if they're going to be postulated by that party come November 22nd. So they know of us, they're asking other places, you have a home for me, can I join you? Some parties are saying, absolutely not, we don't want nothing to do with you all. You all stay with me. Nobody want Malayer Babad Bush in their party. Because if you, at this point in time, nine days, I say they good? Yes, sir. Nine days before postulation. Ensure if you have a home, then you shouldn't run. Police are totally fed up right now with the Justice Minister and her decision makings. And while, don't, don't misunderstand what I'm going to say now. There's a function book. The minister says in that function book, oh, the first one had a mistake, but the new one that she made, the police got the guard the cells. Well, if that's the job, because it used to be so in the past, police used to always guard the, the, the jail. Now, back, back in the 70s and 80s, the jail was right beside the police station, the police used to guard jail. That's how it was. After we decided to build a jail, and we created a, a, a prison, a prison um, system where we had guards that worked for the prison, prison management, etc., etc., about 30 years ago when they went up in Point Blanche. Nothing wrong with that. Then, well, what, 10 years ago, 11 years ago, when um, Minister of Justice Roland Duncan said, listen, we were having a very acute problem with space and so, they created cells at the Phillipsburg um, police station and that was gonna be of temporary nature. Oh, that was what, 10 years, 11 years ago? And the prison guards were there. I think they have about two, three prison guards that work there per shift. So it means two, less or three less at point blanche that's what it means that, that that's all it means in my humble opinion you have a flight 
of police officers that have left the police force. You have not replaced them. You have, when you look at your roster, 250 police officers working. How much at home? How much spending? Because I know you got a lot of those too. You got a lot of police officers on the list that don't work for whatever reason. You see, Minister, this is when things get ticklish. I am not going to tell you the numbers that work at night. You should go and find out. You should go and find out. Because if they have to go upstairs and watch the, the prisoners now, then there will be no patrols on the street at night. Yes, Minister, you're hearing me good. You're hearing me real good now. Because you are endangering the public of Samantha with your stupid decisions. Because that decision is a stupid decision. The timing is totally off. You don't have people to work right now. You don't have. And you're going to do this? Jesus, man. Come on, Minister, man. You know, that the unions fight for their members, I agree. That's what the union does. But unions always have to have each other's back. Because if you don't, today for you, tomorrow for me. And when you're looking for the support from your fellow unions, you will most probably not get it. I'm not going to get in between the unions. That's for them to do. I think they're big boys and girls. But I think that we got to be careful. Police officers are leaving this country for better pay, better pensions, better work books and conditions. They're gone. Most of them going to because they're making good money there. So we need to be careful because we don't want to start importing police officers either from other countries. We have to make sure that we can hold on to ours. That should be our priority. A carbon copy of what's all happening in the dark is coming to the forefront with the house raids last week, but also with the court case held between the prime civilian and the Congo man. Another jam session is scheduled for November 17th, and there's going to be a lot said again, and a lot is going to come out of that pressure cooker again, because she's steaming and she's steaming hard. The problem is the country will continue to suffer, because while we ranting and raving in courts, the country suffering. Many years, many, not years, many months ago, I was very harsh with the government and I was really, really throwing shots. And then suddenly I realized they started targeting my family. They would keep raids. And I spoke out about the raid. Because you read on one side of the street, but you didn't read on the other side of the street. Same brothel. Same type of brothels. And I can recall the minister coming up and said, No, no, no! This is the first one! This is the first one in a raid of many more to come because we check it all! <laughs> minister, when did you check the others? It has been months now. When did you check them? You didn't. It was pure BS. But you're checking. But it's okay. It is what we call politics. This isn't politics. This is politics. But that's okay with me. Because what we'll go up we must come down. You know, I don't know anymore what to think sometimes. And then you see things happen and you ask yourself, do you really have to join the party to stop the raids? Not because you're telling the people you're doing a lot means you're getting a lot done. Remember, postulation is November 22nd, 2023. And the signing of the list is on November 23rd and 24th, 2023. Details are going to follow in other shows and on the now Facebook and Instagram pages. Our manifesto will be published in full on November 22nd, 2023. In closing, 
we still have no amended budget 2023, no budget 2024. Police officers becoming prison guards instead of patrolling our street. Justice workers, especially the police officers, haven't been paid a red cent that they have been owed for the past 13 years. Infrastructure repairs are ludicrous because we painting the bridge instead of fixing the bridge just for a parade. Airport smelling like caca and market vendors going crazy. Court cases left and right. But who lying and who thiefing? Or is it corruption that is running the country? All of these things are happening day in, day out right now. But you know what was interesting? The up leader. The up leader came out in a newspaper article and said he is fed up with the shenanigans at the airport. The VIP service being destroyed right now during the high season. The airport management is not listening to anybody and is doing the biggest nonsense down there by putting a small little airport terminal while they're working on the big one in the highest point of the season. We now have a big problem already. Facebook, we have people saying, don't come on Saturdays to St. Martin because it's a madhouse. And this goes on and on. But what I found strange was that the MP said, I am going to write the Minister of Tiat, the Up Minister, and report this because this has to be dealt with. But it's the same Up Minister, the same Tiat Minister, my fellow MP, that just extended the jackass for a year on your instruction. So tell me, how long will you continue playing this politics? Anybody who changes his principles depending on whom he is dealing with is not fit to lead, the great Nelson Mandela said. Take the message that I'm giving you there. Join me this Wednesday and Friday at 9.30 as we once again look at another issue in detail like our infrastructure will be taken under the loop or GB and its bills will be looked at. Is this a reality or is this a nightmare in the making? Our disastrous high season at the airport and all its dealing and wheelings. What we're going to do is look at it from various angles. Talk about the police issues from various different points of departure. And at least try to bring a workable solution to these issues. Please share my podcast and like and subscribe to my YouTube page. Have a blessed week ahead. See you all Wednesday, 9.30 once again. Bunks is out.